Okay, so to tell you about myself, um, I am a 39-year-old mother of four children, um, single parent, and currently a student, um, working part-time. That's what I do. I'm half Ghanaian and half Italian. I have been in England for about 14 years now. I came to study. Um, I loved travel and tourism. I was working in it for a little while. I now have two little kids, um, three and one and a half, and I'm a single mother. Brilliant. Um, yes. What's your name? Valentina. <laughs> I thought we established that. <laughs> My name's Laura, I'm uh, 30, I just turned 30 not long ago. Um, I have a daughter, she's too soon. Um, that's it, there's nothing really else to tell. I'm not really doing much at the minute besides kind of looking after her and just helping my family with things. So that's, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. My experience with my first pregnancy was, it was literally like, if I put it quite blunt, it was just straight denial. I didn't tell my mum I was pregnant until I was like five months pregnant. I used to walk around the house with these baggy jumpers and stuff like that. Um, obviously because I was scared to tell her. I didn't want to tell her I was a teenage mum. I got pregnant after um, a sort of whirlwind romance with a guy that I met and fell madly in love with. Um, and let's say about nine, ten months into the relationship, um, we... Um, found out we were pregnant. Um, my name is Natasha Smith. I'm 23 years old. I study at the University of Nottingham. I study biochemistry and molecular medicine. Um, I'm a single mother to a beautiful girl called Lola. She's two years old and I had her at uni. I remember the day she found out, well she didn't find out, she asked me. I was um, getting something out of the fridge and she turned around and she said to me, are you pregnant? So I kind of like mumbled a yes, shut the fridge, walked back upstairs. But my first pregnancy wasn't, I still did the things that an 18 year old does. I was still going out with my friends. I was still, um, had my little job. I was still working. Um, I don't think I, I was preparing myself for the responsibility of a child. That never came into my head at that age. I think there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a topic that's not really spoken about a lot and that's um, mental health for single mothers. Um, I think when, when you become a mother so much changes, um, you lose yourself, you lose friends, you know, you lose a lot of, um, you know, your, your freedom and, um, and with it comes all these responsibilities that all of a sudden come to you. It's not just, oh, it's such a cute baby, it's, it's, it's not, you know, people post amazing pictures and it's smiley, but behind the scenes it's quite difficult. And you can, you can get to a really dark place um, if you don't kind of have a really strong support network. My name is Jay Atty. Um, I am a single parent of two children. Um, I trained as a Conte Surveyor. Um, years back, I was trained by a large construction, probably one of the biggest construction firm in the country as a training QS. Um, and then I went on to do my degree. But after I tried to work within the industry with two children, I was forced to um, take redundancy and then work within education because it suited the timetable of the children because I couldn't keep that full time work while raising them. Um, it's been a challenge, but at the same time, it's been a joy because they're now grown up now. So all I do is give counsel and pray. When a woman goes through domestic violence, it's like you get caught into a trap. So your world becomes different from the world that other people can see around you. How, how you think, how you see things and how you perceive things is totally different to what other people can see. And I couldn't see through the clouds. I couldn't see, I couldn't see any way out. And people could just see in and see what was happening to me. You need to get help. You need to get out of the situation. You need to, and I never, I couldn't, I couldn't, I don't know. You know, you thought you've got emotional ties. You still love the person you think they're gonna change. You think you can change them, you know. Um, but. It, it just, 
it was and it was just repetitive it was just violent all the time it it happens one time and the first time it happens to you you're in shock second time you're like mm. third time you're like mm. fourth time it just becomes habit you get you, you it gets to a point where you get used to it you expect it my my most challenging experience has been f there, are f there are a few actually but firstly financial stability and being able to be a provider the difficulty in earning as a mother and taking care of your children, just, just that balance of being able to make money and still be able to take care of your children, that, that, that's that been very difficult, yeah. I remember when my youngest one started sec um, primary and I couldn't go to the, um, I took a day off to drop her and then I couldn't pick them up the way I wanted to. And I was working for one of the biggest housing company at that time and I remember saying to them, I have to, I can't do the, the shift. I remember my manager saying to me, Jay, you signed up for this. I said, my kids are not going to be on the line. I'll do nine to five and I'm not doing earlier and I'm not doing any later. The time when I left, the time when I came out of it was, I remember the last fight that we had and I think I was in the bathroom and he just literally just punched me in my face for no reason. I was like, why? Like, I just didn't understand it. And this was after I'd given him 200 pounds that he asked me for. And I remember he walked out of the bathroom and I was in over the sink just spitting out blood and back, the back of my teeth, bits of my teeth were coming out. So I was spitting out, spitting out, spitting out. And I just thought, I don't know if I can say this on camera, but you can edit, you can do the beep or whatever. I was like, F this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've had enough. I've had enough. And I remember going to the fridge, having a drink of wine and stuff like that. And obviously it's a little bit of Dutch courage or whatever. And I started to pack his stuff, pack it all into a bag, put it outside the front door, put it outside the front door, shut the front door. And I ran upstairs to the bedroom and um, he come back from wherever he was. And he rang my phone cause all the house was in darkness and his stuff was outside. I said, I'm out. He said, I know you're in the house, open the door. So I said, I'm not opening the door. And he was like, open that door. I said, I'm not opening the door. With that, boom, boom, just kick the door off, like kick the door. I just heard the door go off. So I tried to run to the bedroom door to shut the door. I remember it like it was yesterday. I will never forget it. So I'm Abigail Adele. I was born in Germany and I came to London 14 years ago. I've been to over 24 countries in the last four years. I love traveling. And I think the most exciting bit about myself is when I got pregnant in my second year of university with twins. Um, what drives me would be, of course, my daughter. Like, if I didn't have my child, I probably would have dropped out of university, which is really weird, considering people usually think when you have a child at university, that's when you should drop out. But she's actually been my drive and my motivation to finish university and to be successful and to be able to provide for her and give her everything she needs in life because she's no different from Bill Gates' child or any any other child in the world. So she's definitely my motivation, definitely. Oh, I don't think there's one specific emotion, but definitely love, definitely love and, and gratitude. Um, when I think about my child, I, um, I think about um, God's love really, and ever so grateful to to be able to be a mother to both of them. I do love them. I think love, I think love, God's love, yeah. They've made me cry twice, but that's because I was just very overwhelmed. So the first time I cried was because Sinead, so the second twin, was in hospital for three weeks. And they said, oh, pump some of your breast milk for her and see whether that will make her get better. And she was not getting better. And then as a mother, that moment in time, I felt like I was, I had failed. I was letting her down because why isn't my breast milk making her better? So that's one time I cried. And the second time I cried was we went to Paris when there were three with my best friend from uni. And they were just a nightmare. They wouldn't listen. They were throwing tantrums at the airport, making noise, running away. And then when I got home, I was like, oh my God, this is hard. Because they actually live with my mum. 
and my mum helps me look after them. So I go and do whatever I want, what I like. And when I had them for that amount of time, like the three, four days, I was like, being a mum is a lot. And I'm quite grateful for my mum and my dad helping me by looking after them. Another motivation, probably my mum. Um, my mum was a single mum when she had me. So I know the struggles she's been through. She's, she met my dad when I was four. When I found out I was pregnant, I think because she didn't want me to go through the same struggles she went through. And on top of that, I was at university. It was a really, really hard thing for her to process. So I've always said to myself, I need to focus on university, focus on life and just make her proud, make her proud, make her think that, you know, me having Lola was no setback in any way, shape or form. It just made me stronger. So. Definitely my family and my daughter. Um, religion has played a part. Uh, I, I, I was raised Christian. Um, and the good thing about sort of my upbringing is my mum pretty much left us to kind of, she said, you know, this is, this is what I know. This is what I know to be true. If you want to do it, go for it. If you don't, it's up to you. We're never forced to do anything. So I think that kind of allowed us to kind of find God in our own way. And um, sort of my mum, it's, it's, I kind of mirrored the situation that my mum had me in. So she was never very judgmental with me. None of my sisters were. Again, I think I put myself sort of on this pedestal. I'm the oldest of, of, of five. So kind of getting in a situation where you're pregnant and you're not married. Um, I, and then to kind of compound that with Christianity and know what the Bible says about, you know, premarital sex and, and what basically the family unit should be and the reason why marriage is important before you have children and kind of now seeing the consequences of not doing that, sort of having, you know, you know, have, you have a child and their, their dad isn't around because you guys didn't get married. So it's kind of like, it, 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 it's, it's sort of like a constant churning in the back of my head that it's, it, there was a reason that, you know, from what I know and from what I've been taught and what I believe that things go a certain way and, and, and yeah, it's just, it's just always, it's always on your mind, I think. I think I was more stressed out about having to tell my parents than actually having to go through with it. Part of me was, in a way, actually a bit excited because I was in a happy relationship and my partner felt the same way. So, but I was more scared about what others would say. And also growing up in a African church, the stigma with getting pregnant at a young age outside marriage, especially when you've gone off to university, it's not, it's not something you, you know, it's not something to be proud of. So I was more concerned about what my parents would say, what my family would say. My dad is also a pastor in the church. So it was sort of like, you know, how am I going to deal with this? How are, what are people going to think of me? What are they going to say? Um, how are they going to react? What's my mum going to do? Because they're held so highly in church. So it's going to affect them as well as me. It's not just me, it affects it's everyone around me. So it was a very challenging period. So my community were very supportive after I'd given birth. They were shocked because a lot of people didn't know. People came to hospital, people came to my house, they gave me money, you know, when you're celebrating that the babies come to the world. And one thing I definitely liked, people were just so supportive. I had Pampers for free for like six months with like twins, can you imagine? I didn't have to buy Pampers, didn't have to buy wipes. People were asking me, what do I need? How can I help? Cooking food. And I thought, wow, this is cool. In the sense of that, although I did something that might be a bit shameful, but they still supported me in a way. Was this your church community? Just knowing my parents, friends, their community and my friends as well. I don't think, to be honest with you, I don't think religion has shaped anything in terms of my experience with my family and my children at all. I think I've become more of a, I'm trying to become more spiritual and aware of the world around me and question things and look at people and try to see where they're coming from. Because I think, no, religion has, has nothing to do with how I'm feeling or thinking now at all. I couldn't even feel it, but you, you know you're getting hit, you know you're getting punched, and I, I couldn't even feel it. And I remember 
I just had my second daughter. She, she was six months, and my other daughter was be, would have been about seven at the time, who's 14 now. And she was in the middle of all of it. And then he turned on the light, because I turned off all the lights in the house, and literally my whole bed looked like a massacre. I was just covered in blood. My daughter was covered in blood. Anyway, cut a long story short, we, we finally got to Lucian Hospital and I remember standing there covered in this blood with this baby in my hands and he's standing there and the woman at the front desk is saying, what happens, do you know, and he's saying, oh, I've got a cut on my hand and my daughter's, you know, been hurt and whatever else, she's got a cut on her hand and the woman said to me, I was standing at another window and the woman said to me, are you okay? And I just looked at her and she said, would you like to go and take your daughter and take the other baby round the corner to the children's A&E? And I said, OK. She said, we just need to ask you a few questions a bit more about your injuries, Mr. Ihanacho. As I've got round the corner, I stood at the desk and I said, this man is trying to kill me. And they literally locked me in a room. And that was the last time I ever spoke to him. That was it. I ain't spoken to him since. He tried to take me to court a couple of times for visitation. No, that's not going to happen <laughs> ever in a million years. But yeah, and I got free from that.